Hello, I'm Alan Weil, Editor-in-Chief of Health Affairs. Thank you for joining us for today's Policy Spotlight. Policy Spotlight is a series of virtual events Health Affairs launched last year featuring in-depth conversations with influential health policy experts. Previous Spotlight events have featured CMS Administrator Chiquita brooks Lashur, FDA Commissioner Robert Califf, and most recently, CMS uh, Principal Deputy Commissioner Chief Operating Officer Jonathan Blum, and many others. If you missed any of these events, as they aired, they are recorded and you can find them on our website. Today, we're joined by Dave Chakshi, former commissioner of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. New York City, of course, was at the center of the early months of the COVID-19 pandemic in the United States. The challenges the city faced previewed what was to come around the rest of the country and New York's efforts to stop the spread of COVID and treat those infected helped many other regions in the United States and around the world prepare. New York also pioneered efforts to meet the social needs of its residents uh, during the lockdown. We'll discuss these topics and many more today. Uh, before my formal introduction, I'll just say to you in the audience, if you're watching us live, there's a Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen. Please feel free to submit questions. I'll do my best to incorporate them into the conversation. Please keep them brief. Uh, if you send them at, when we're wrapping up, it'll be a little bit too late. Uh, but I do like uh, weaving in the topics of interest to you if you can put those in the Q&A box. It's now my pleasure to formally introduce to you Dave Chakshi, uh, as I noted, for the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene from August 2020 through March of this year. He's currently a visiting fellow at the New York Health Foundation. Uh, Dr. Chakshi was trained as a primary care physician at the University of Pennsylvania before his appointment as the 43rd health commissioner for New York City. He was uh, at New York City Health and Hospitals for six years, including three years as inaugural chief population health officer. Earlier, he worked in the New York State Department of Health, the Louisiana Department of Health, both before and after Hurricane Katrina. He's been a White House fellow, was principal health advisor to the Secretary of the U.S. Uh, Veterans Affairs. Um, and as I'll allude to later in our conversation, wrote uh, co-wrote two uh, commentary pieces in Health Affairs in 2020, specifically focused on New York's response to the uh, emerging pandemic. Uh, welcome, Dr. Chakshi. We've known each other long enough. I hope you don't mind if I call you Dave. Please do. And I'm really delighted to be here. Thanks for having me on. I'm looking forward so much to this conversation. I've enjoyed being able to work with you in different capacities over the years, and we really do like to keep this conversational, and that's easy with someone uh, like you. I, I promise you we will not only talk about COVID. Uh, your career has covered many other important topics, and I want to make sure we have an opportunity to discuss them, but it is hard to have a conversation like this without starting with COVID, given where uh, New York City was when you took over the position as head of the health uh, department. So maybe if you could just set the stage for us, uh, talk about those opening days coming in on the job. What did you see? What did you do? What did you feel? Just give us a, give us the view from your seat. Certainly. Well, I'll, I'll start with the, the devastating first wave of uh, COVID-19 in New York City uh, in March and April of 2020 when I was uh, actually at New York City Health and Hospitals, which uh, for your listeners is the, the public health care system of, uh, of the city. Um, places like Bellevue Hospital, which is where I've been practicing since 2014, uh, Elmhurst Hospital, which I live around the corner from in Queens, New York, uh, Kings County, Lincoln Hospital in the Bronx. Um, you know, these are uh, places that are both uh, anchors in their respective communities. Um, and where uh, particularly low-income people in New York City have, have turned to, you know, for solace and care for, uh, for decades, if not longer. And, um, you know, the memories from that first wave of COVID in New York City will, will forever be seared in my memory. And I think I speak for so many health workers here in the city when I say that because of how uh, devastating it was because of how much suffering we were witness to, uh, because of the uncertainty that characterized, you know, so much of the tragedy that was experienced. Um, you know, I remember speaking with the medical residents at 
Elmhurst Hospital um, and talking to them about what it was like to take care of, of patients uh, as they were just trying to keep pace with the deluge of COVID pneumonia that they were seeing. Um, and I'll never forget, you know, the way that they described what it was like to uh, do their morning rounds, you know, to check on their patients um, overnight uh, after their overnight, um, you know, stay uh, and finding that two or three or four of their patients, um, you know, had passed away, uh, which is something that had never once happened to me, you know, during the entire duration of my medical training. So I just put myself in their shoes for a moment and thought what it must be like to, um, you know, to, to check for uh, the pulse of their patient and, and sense the coolness of a hand, you know, bereft even of uh, the small dignity of being warmed by the clasp of a loved one one last time. Um, and so those are you know, those are the memories and the traumas really that, you know, that so many of us uh, carry forward from uh, that devastating first wave. Um, and then, you know, fast forwarding a little bit to get to your question, um, I, I took the helm of the health department a few months after that in August of 2020. Uh, it was a period of uncertainty, you know, we were working on, um, on trying to reopen the largest uh, school district in the country. Uh, we were preparing for the hope for vaccination campaign, you know, which came uh, even sooner than than we had anticipated, um, and grappling with making the right decisions under again tremendous uncertainty, whether it was related to economic uh, reopenings um, or thinking about how to prepare for you know the the subsequent waves of COVID nineteen. So, um, you know, I, I guess the piece that I'll end on for this is one of the thoughts that sort of gave me sustenance, you know, that fueled me through those really devastating and dark times was the notion that at least this level of suffering, you know, this scale of tragedy would finally shake us out of our complacency when it came to some of the topics that I'll hope we'll, we'll cover, you know, the notion of universal health care or massive investment in public health or thinking about racial equity in health differently. Um, and, you know, as we sit here in 2022, I have to say a lot of that has has not yet come to pass. We, we haven't been shaken out of that complacency, even, you know, having lost a million of our fellow Americans. Um, and so, you know, I, I hope that we won't accept that as a static reality, um, but rather take the memory of uh, everything that we have lost over the past two plus years and figure out how to channel it into the will and the volition uh, to do things differently when it comes to organizing our health system. Well, we will talk about the, uh, the work that's been done and the work that is unfinished. I appreciate you just in our opening minutes alluding to that. Before we turn there completely, I do want to go a little more into the New York experience. Uh, so I'm in, I'm trying to envision you 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 started with a, a clinician's story and the clinician's experience, which is appropriate, of course, for you. And you came out of a huge clinically oriented system, but now you're in a uh, city department of public health, which is uh, a policy setting and policy making. Uh, it's a big move, a big shift. Uh, of course, we're a policy journal. Our audience is interested in policy. So I wonder if you could help me take that really beautifully told story you did of the clinician experience and say, now that I'm over here, what, what does my clinical experience and what I'm seeing out there in my city point me to from a policy perspective? Mm. Well, you know, I have to say one of the animating ideas of my career has been to try to challenge the, you know, the false dichotomy that exists between healthcare and public health or, you know, the medical side or the clinical side and 
um, all of the drivers of health, of which, as you well know, policy you know is a major one, and not just health policy, but also social and economic policy. Um, you know, when people ask me to, to describe myself, I often use the phrase, I'm a primary care doctor with a public health heart. Um, and really that reflects the, the aspiration that we can bring, you know, those, um, those sectors together. You know, I just think about it from the perspective of one of, one of my patients or really, you know, just one of the New Yorkers that I had the privilege to serve. And they, they don't really, uh, necessarily think about the difference between healthcare delivery and public health uh, in the same way that maybe we wonks do, you know, in, in terms of thinking about the issues. Um, I know that for my patients, they want the things that will help keep them healthy, uh, access to healthy food, um, you know, uh, the ability to be physically active, uh, education for our children, you know, physical safety and security, um, and also a high quality health system that's there when we do fall sick. Uh, and my, my thought is always to keep that person in mind and to say their perspective is really to tell people like us, look, sort it out on the back end. You know, if you have to work with your counterparts, um, you know, across those sectors, um, please do so, so so we can you know live uh, our most fulfilled lives. And so, um, yes, it's very true. You know, I I have a very you know sort of this deep background in healthcare delivery, uh, particularly in a safety net system. Um, but even that was really oriented around population health and bringing the notion of you know the fundamental drivers of health often being outside of the walls of the clinic to bear. Um, but to do so in a way that takes advantage of the tremendous resources uh, that we have at our disposal, you know, in the healthcare system, almost $4 trillion when we think of it writ large, uh, you know, flowing through the American health system and trying to orient as much of it as possible, not just toward care, which is important when we need it, but to those more fundamental drivers of health. And presumably your experience as the population health officer at health and hospitals then is part of that bridge. Are there elements of what you were doing in that role that fed directly into your approach when you moved over to the Department of Public Health? Um, certainly, I mean, it was, it was uh, very seamless, you know, in some ways. Um, the focus on social needs, uh, you know, I'm proud to have started the first team uh, working on unmet social needs or the social determinants of health uh, within the health and hospital system. So looking at things like housing and transportation, uh, we actually, um, we started the first uh, cash transfer program actually early on during the pandemic, which I think is part of the health affairs article that we published. Um, and uh, so that was really, you know, taking the notion of what public health gets very intuitively, you know, the idea that it's not just about medicine or uh, access to healthcare, but all of those other things, you know, sort of the, the links between physical health, behavioral health, and social needs um, that we have to integrate um, into a more holistic model of care. And I'll say, you know, the vice versa was true. You know, when I served as health commissioner, um, I appointed the very first uh, chief medical officer for the health department, um, Dr. Michelle Morris, uh, who uh, we were very deliberate in saying uh, it's very important for a health department and for public health to also have uh, a stake in the ground when it comes to the delivery system. So one of the initiatives, for example, that Dr. Morris uh, really helped to spearhead and launch was our coalition to end racism and clinical algorithms, where we work very directly with healthcare delivery systems across the city on a topic that um, is central to public health, you know, racial equity, um, but which requires the partnership and participation of the delivery system. So it's really about trying to do it from both both ends of, uh, you know, sort of the splintering that we see in our health system. Um, to, to work toward an integration across all of it. And you mentioned sort of knocking us out of our complacency and sustained change. 
I'd like to walk through a few topics where I'd say the the, the story is mixed. Um, maybe we should start with vaccination. I mean, I from where I sit, New York uh, took a pretty aggressive stance around uh, vaccines, vaccine requirements. Um, I would say that your political room to do that probably did emerge from some uh, knocking people out of their complacency. Can you tell me a little about what you did? When I'm going to assume that some of our listeners have have no no background on what happened, so maybe provide a little background on what you all did, but also uh, what went into those decisions. Yeah, well, I'm I'm very proud of what we were able to do with our vaccination campaign. So you'll have to cut me off, Alan, when. Uh, when we need to move on to the next topic. But let me just give you the headlines. Um, you know, it was, the, it was the largest vaccination campaign in the history of New York City. Um, we vaccinated over 6 million New Yorkers. You know, um, uh, it was uh, something where we were able to achieve 90% of New Yorkers with at least one dose of the vaccine, 80% um, fully vaccinated, you know, by the end of 2021. And our strategy was, um, was really to build on a foundation of equitable access to lower barriers as far as we possibly could uh, in terms of getting the vaccine out into people's neighborhoods, both by building you know, city infrastructure, mobile vaccination clinics, our own health department sites, working with trusted community physicians, uh, and then ultimately, you know, we were the first jurisdiction that said, we will come to your home, um, not, not just for individuals who are homebound, any New Yorker uh, could give us a call and say, um, you know, I want you to come to my home and vaccinate me and my family members. And we organized the infrastructure to be able to do that so that it was truly universally accessible. Um, we did that by June of 2021, but we went further because we knew to get to the levels of vaccination that we needed. Um, building upon that foundation of equitable access, we also layered on uh, incentives. You know, we had a hundred dollar incentive for, um, you know, for multiple doses of the vaccine, and then vaccine requirements as well. You know, we were the first major uh, United States jurisdiction. Um, to adopt a vaccine passport. It was called the key to NYC, specifically for indoor dining, you know, indoor uh, fitness, other higher risk activities. Um, and then we, we adopted vaccine requirements for our public sector employees, you know, starting with the healthcare sector, but then moving to all public employees, and then eventually expanding the circle out even further than that. Um, you know, ultimately, this was about being prepared for what we knew was to come. You know, a lot of this happened during the Delta wave in 2021. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm so grateful that we were, and Mayor de Blasio, you know, the, the mayor that I served, um, deserves so much credit for this. Um, he was willing to take these bold and controversial steps, which put us in a categorically different position from many other places around the country as we confronted the Omicron wave later in 2021. We had levels of, of vaccination and immunity um, that allowed us to weather that wave in a way that um, averted hospitalizations and, and saved lives. Um, you know, it's estimated that uh, the vaccination campaign saved upward of 40,000 lives in New York City alone. And it was because of those aggressive steps that we took. So I wanted to go back to your earlier comment about sort of lasting change. Obviously, we don't know what will happen in the next pandemic. We don't know what the pandemic will look like. Um, but you describe what sounds like a success story and, and a success story that came out of uh, people seeing things differently than they did before. So I guess I just want to ask, like, how how much of what you think happened is the platform to build upon for the next and really addressing some of the fundamental issues of access and equity? Or do you think that was a one off? It was a particularly horrific time. We were able to do what we did. But next time, they're just going to start from scratch. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the questions that keeps me up at night, because I am worried that, um, you know, we we haven't 
uh, learn the lessons, particularly when you try to sort of expand this out to the national context, um, you know, with respect to uh, the response to COVID-19 and learning the lessons for, um, you know, for, for the next pandemic uh, and really even for subsequent waves of this pandemic. You know, I worry that, um, uh, that there's uh, what I think of as a collective amnesia, you know, that, that sort of takes hold in our society uh, that keeps us from um, distilling out and, and learning those lessons to the degree that we need to. Um, part of the reason that I want to make sure to share the New York City story is that I do think it's an example of um, muscular public health, you know, like what public health can do when uh, there is political will, when there is uh, investment. You, we benefited from huge uh, federal resources, you know, that supported what we did, but also city and state resources um, that were behind this. Uh, and it shows, you know, what's possible when when we bring all of that together. Um, but you know, at the national level, things are certainly trickier. Um, there are uh, there's eroded trust. There's political polarization. Um, there are the currents of misinformation and disinformation. You know, all of these things uh, I think have to be grappled with when we think about um, how. Uh, you know, a pandemic response should carry forward um, into, uh, you know, into the future. Um, and I'll, let's just get a little bit more concrete. You know, the, the notion that we can't even fund COVID response appropriately right now should be setting off alarm bells for everyone because it means that um, almost certainly uh, we don't have the will to invest in pandemic prevention going forward to do the things like, you know, investing in the public health workforce uh, that's necessary to make sure that we're shoring up our surveillance systems, uh, our data infrastructure, um, and making sure that we have the ability to, when we have these miraculous breakthroughs like the mRNA vaccines, actually get them to the places that they need to go. Um, and so for that, uh, I think there has to be a broader reckoning um, at the national level uh, that's going to require new narratives about the role of public health, um, you know, and about uh, the need for massive investment in the type of infrastructure that I'm describing. Well, I'm, I'm not going to promise that COVID won't come up in the second half of our time together, but let me just uh, do one more, more directly on it, and then I, I'll bring in some other topics. Uh, one of the uh, papers you co-authored for us uh, it had to do with telehealth. And that's another area where you could say, well, we really shifted things a lot. There were big changes. Um, so I wonder if you could say a little bit about the New York City experience and also, again, sort of your reflections on whether this is a sustained change. Is it, is it an important enough sustained change to feel like it's a victory? I'd be interested in your take on this. Yeah, this is uh, such a, uh, an important example. And I think it um, it signifies, you know, some some of the broader trends that we're talking about. But I'll just start maybe a little bit more personally because, you know, that um, that article uh, that we wrote that was led by by Jen Lau and Janine Knutson, and my colleagues at Health and Hospitals, we had been working really toiling for you know three and a half four years antecedent to the pandemic on the telehealth strategy at Health and Hospitals. And I have to tell you, and for those who are out there, you know who we're doing something similar. Uh, each inch was so hard won to be able to make the transition to telehealth, to get a few more patients, you know, to use virtual modes, to line up the reimbursement, to convince administrators and clinicians, you know, that this was worth doing. And then, uh, literally within the span of 48 hours, I mean, I remember it so vividly in March of 2020 we flipped our entire ambulatory care system onto telehealth because we had to, because the city was shut down, because all of our ambulatory clinicians were being conscripted to take care of COVID patients in the hospital. Um, and folks still had diabetes and hypertension and kidney disease and all of the things, you know, that needed caring for. Um, and so we were, we felt really vindicated that we had built, you know, an infrastructure, which I will say came under considerable strain, you know, as we went from a few thousand encounters to 
hundreds of thousands of encounters, you know, uh, literally within the span of weeks. So for me, I, just to like name the really tangible lesson there, uh, it shows how in the heat of a crisis, you can really melt away the false barriers to progress. And that is something else that I hope we hold on to, you know, in terms of lessons from the pandemic, that um, these things that are sensible that we should be doing, but which there are multiple layers of obstacles to, um, we have to remember that when there was the will to actually completely change the system, we could, and it worked, and it served our patients well. Um, so, you know, let's talk about like where, where that's going to go uh, looking forward. And a lot of those gains are under jeopardy. You know, some of the reimbursement streams uh, are still temporary or they were, you know, aligned with um, the, the emergency declarations, you know, of the pandemic. Uh, and so some of that is starting to snap back to what we saw in 2019. And the way that I think about it is we have to really sort out some of the wheat from the chaff. It's not that, you know, every single telehealth intervention is worth carrying forward. Um, in some cases, you know, telehealth can induce demand in a way that's not providing high value care. Um, <coughs> excuse me, but there is so much of what we did experience that we should hold on to and that we should make sure um, you know, that we do carry forward uh, into the policy environment um, post the pandemic. So to give you, you know, a handful of, of examples, um, the way in which virtual care was used to, um, you know, to expand access, particularly in rural areas, um, particularly to expand access to specialty care, uh, you know, we moved uh, some of our buprenorphine uh, clinics uh, to virtual care. Uh, we moved um, some of our other, uh, you know, very sort of um, scarce services in a way that was able to uh, expand the reach of them. Um, and those are the things that we have to uh, make sure are resourced and reimbursed appropriately going forward. Okay, I said we'll turn to other topics, so I'll begin, although, again, the relationship across these topics is so uh, complex that I'm sure it's not a full pivot. Um, so you had a population health uh, responsibility at uh, Health and Hospitals. You were the commissioner. You, uh, one of your pieces that you wrote for us talked about uh, unmet social needs, and I know you've been focusing lately on life expectancy. We've seen the declines and we've seen the disparities by race and ethnicity in those declines. Again, that's a COVID story, but but it's much more. So I wonder if you could uh, help us look at the non-COVID part of that story and the non-COVID lessons or the lessons at least that extend well beyond COVID. Yeah, well, thank you for calling attention to this, Alan, because I think it's something that um, uh, is, an, is, is something else that should really shake us, you know, that um, we are living through an era where American life expectancy is declining, period. You know, this is happening on our watch. Um, and that is something that for those of us who care about health policy, uh, for, for those of us who feel some responsibility for it, um, this should really be setting off alarm bells, you know, with respect to what's happening. And it's very important to dissect it out in the way that you're alluding to. You know, I think of the decline in life expectancy as really the composite of three phenomena. The first you've already alluded to, and that's COVID. And you know, it's a very real, um, a very real part of it over the past, you know, two and a half years in particular. Uh, the mortality from COVID um, has caused the majority of the decrement in life expectancy. Although I will say focusing narrowly on the virus, um, it does obscure the fact that it is polarization and mistrust and some other deeper societal forces that have contributed to a significant part of that COVID mortality in the United States. Um, and we can see that because in many of our peer countries, there was a rebound in life expectancy starting in 2021 when vaccination was available. You know, in places like uh, Spain, for example, um, we see that there was a rebound 
Uh, but we did not see that in the United States, despite um, being faster than many of our peer countries to actually roll out our vaccination campaign. So we have to look at that deeper level and ask, why, why is that? Why did we lose so many of our fellow Americans to COVID-19 when we had the safe and effective vaccines available and which, you know, which our peers were able to put to better use um, than we did? So that's, that's the COVID part of the story. But to get to your question, you know, the non-COVID part, there are two other, you know, um, uh, two other uh, parts to that composite phenomenon. The first is really a much longer story, and that's the divergence in life expectancy between the United States peer countries, which you can trace back to the 1970s or 1980s. A lot of this has to do with um, the social and economic forces, uh, which lead to lower income Americans, and particularly Black, Hispanic, and Native Americans having higher mortality um, than, than other groups of Americans. Uh, and that's part of the reason why since 2014, we have decelerated you know, when it comes to our life expectancy trends. And the third, very briefly, just to name it, in terms of the life expectancy trend is what I think of as the parallel pandemics. And this is where it gets a little bit murky because it's not exactly COVID, but it's the way in which the reverberating effects of the pandemic, for example, through the overdose crisis or through the worsening of maternal mortality that we're seeing, you know, in our country, um, uh, or you know, the uh, the foregone care, deferred immunizations that we're seeing, um, are uh, are also contributing to uh, the decrement in life expectancy. So it's not exactly a virus effect, even if it's a pandemic effect. Yeah, you know, we had a group of papers on diabetes earlier this year, and if you look at the numbers and you look at the explanations, and I'm, I'm not a clinician, but I read it and I say, this is just the pandemic in slow motion. It's the, all the disparities are there, the social determinants that are leading to growth is there. Um, obviously, there are differences, but it, in terms of the numbers and the disparities, uh, it, it's not as if we don't have experience with the, the things that are killing Americans and killing them prematurely and killing them in an inequitable way. It's just uh, we, we didn't, we never have harnessed the kind of response to something like diabetes that we have, that we did to the pandemic. So that was uh, a, a, a sad telling moment when, uh, when you just see this sort of repeated in different domains. Yeah, these are, you know, I think of these as the slower moving disasters. You know, we're we're at our best, both as doctors, but also, you know, in the health sector writ large um, when it comes to, um, to crisis. But we really struggle when it comes to those slower moving crises, you know, whether it's diabetes and obesity or um, or the overdose crisis. Uh, and that that is really, you know, the challenge uh, when it comes to uh, premature mortality and morbidity. There was an analysis uh, that was published earlier this year that comes to mind, uh, which I, I think we have to think about it as we, we love to jargonize things, you know, so we use this phrase years of life lost or, you know, premature years of life lost. Um, and we should think about this as birthdays lost, you know, as the the, the birthdays that are taken from our family members, our neighbors, our brothers and sisters. Um, and, uh, you know, this analysis showed that uh, in 2019, so this was before the pandemic, there were 16 million uniquely American birthdays lost when you compare us to peer high income countries. Um, and that's something that we have to contend with uh, that doesn't just have to do with pandemic response. It has to do with all of those other structural factors um, that are much more about the social and economic policies in our country. So I want to try to find the middle space here and bring in a part of a question that was submitted by someone listening who asked, what are the most important public health challenges for cities? And then ask the impertinent question and how should they be funded? Uh, let's set the funding issue aside, at least for a moment, although I'd love to come back to it if we have time. 
so one of the things I'm trying to grapple with as I listen to you is uh, that the, the source of the challenges you describe, the sources are broad and they are social and economic and political trends. But there's also a core public health function. And I wonder, I, I don't mean to, just like I'm really glad you talked about not trying to have keep this artificial distinction between the the, the delivery system and public health. I, I don't want to try to draw a, a line between social, economic, political, and public health because there shouldn't be one. That said, every position, every role, every government agency has an area of focus where the control, uh, uh, the, the scope of authority is, is greatest. And the public health department is never going to alone address the economic and social conditions that lead to poor health. So taking the, the narrower, but not the narrowest view of public health, where would you say that the key challenges lie today? And um, what, it's a great question. And, you know, just to um, say back a little bit of the, the way that you're formulating it, um, the, the challenge in getting to structural and root causes is that it can be, become paralyzed. It can become so dilute as to, um, as to leave you rudderless with respect to the so what, you know, like, what are we going to do about it? If, if the issues are these giant, you know, challenges of tax policy and, uh, you know, and, and thinking about social equity, then what are our footholds, whether you're a health department, you know, or working at, at some other point in the health system. Um, and so this is something that I've, uh, I've grappled with as well. Uh, and, you know, I, I would give a couple of, um, of angles into this. The first is that um, it does require accountability on the part of health departments, you know, um, the healthcare system. Uh, and there are a few implications from thinking about it as accountability, whether it's accountability for the drop in life expectancy or other, you know, summary measures of health. Um, one is to stop doing more harm. And, you know, particularly from the healthcare system's vantage point, this is a conversation that I think needs to be elevated. The growing financialization of healthcare you just look at the amount of medical debt, you know, that's being created in our country. Um, and so in the same breath that we're talking about setting up a food pharmacy or addressing the transportation needs of our patients, you know, we have hospitals suing low income patients for, um, you know, for, for bill collection. And so, you know, one way to really make this very tangible and soluble is to say from the health system, how do we focus on uh, trying to stop doing more harm? And I think, again, particularly the healthcare side of the equation is really important. On the public health side, or you know, for health departments, one you know, very specific intervention uh, that I think warrants even more attention is community health workers and the public health workforce. And the reason is that this is one of the few places where you can actually address some of those fundamental social and economic drivers because you're creating additional jobs while setting up you know, the, uh, the workforce that we need both for the next pandemic as well as for some of those slower moving disasters that we've talked about. It also gets at some of the core challenges like mistrust and distrust that exist at a community level that hold us back when it comes to our most effective interventions in health. And one thing that I'd love to talk a little bit more about is the fact that our health system is all breakthrough and not enough follow through. You know, we uh, like you just take the, the curative therapies for hepatitis C, the new antivirals that literally can cure patients from hepatitis C. They've been on the market for a decade now and only a third uh, only a quarter to a third of insured patients are getting those therapies. So this is what we mean by follow through, you know, to actually get those things to the places where they will have the most benefit. And an intervention like community health workers shores up, you know, the gaps um, to actually 
uh, be able to, to deliver things where we need them. So that's a little bit about how I think about it from both the healthcare side and um, the public health side. Uh, and I guess the final thing that I'll say is that, um, you know, there is, there is a role for advocacy, but I was not one of those health commissioners who adopted the idea of health in all policies. As much as I might believe it intellectually, you know, I can tell you it wouldn't have gone over very well if I called up the transportation commissioner and said, hey, let me tell you about health in all policies and you should be doing this and that and this. Um, it went over a lot better when I called up the education chancellor and said, hey, I hear you're struggling with X or Y problem. I think I might be able to help you with that. Um, and there's a health benefit to doing it as well. So I think that you, know, you have to have some humility in figuring out how to solve other sectors problems in a way that also advances health. I certainly hope that in the best instances, uh, implementation of a health and all policies approach is not the health director telling everyone else what to do to improve health. But I, I appreciate your point that uh, this is about cooperation and offering assistance in particularly difficult times. The, your answer to the last question uh, raised, particularly when you start talking about the financial side and the debt, and these are topics that really concern me a great deal as well. Uh, you know, you worked in a, a, a very, very large public system. You worked in the, of course, as the health commissioner, but New York has a very large private sector too when it comes to health care. Talk to me a little bit about the, the interplay there. The, the, uh, I, you've used this theme of sort of breaking down some of the barriers. And uh, so I'm curious what you observed, what you tried to do, whether you feel like the private delivery system was as close a partner. Again, I, I, I didn't promise I'd never mention COVID again in the COVID response, but also in other initiatives, or if it's sort of a public writ large, but then there's the private sector over there. How did, how did you experience that? Yeah, well, I, I won't mince words on this one. I, I think that the private delivery system needs to do more. Um, and we saw that uh, during COVID, you know, just to give you my specific example in New York City, um, certain systems really stepped up to, to the challenge. They were ready to do what we called load balancing, you know, when we needed to transfer patients. Um, you know, I, I remember calling up the CEOs of different health systems around New York City at the very inception of our vaccination campaign. And I said, look, I need a little bit of help to set up, you know, our infrastructure, particularly as our supply started to increase. And the response was quite variable. Um, and I think that what that shows and what is problematic is that we have sort of left it up to um, the, the willingness and the, you know, um, <coughs> the, uh, you know the, the willingness to do good rather than something that is more systematic. Uh, and something that recognizes that whether it's, uh, you know, the very sizable tax exemptions that nonprofit hospitals get, um, or just the conception of the public good, you know, when it comes to public health, uh, that everyone has a responsibility, um, you know, if, if we're talking about trying to make these advancements in, um, in the health sector. So I, I do think that um, you know, more, more needs to happen. I think that some of that will have to be taken on in a regulatory approach. You know, I've already alluded to, um, to hospitals a few times, but I think in particular, the ways in which we are seeing uh, financialization hurt patients um, is coming to a head. Uh, and I actually worry that things will get worse in the near future because you're going to see greater pressure on hospital margins, you know, for a confluence of reasons in the coming months. Um, and so there has to be a counterweight, uh, you know, a counterweight to that. Um, so yeah, I think those are those are most of the thoughts that I have uh, on the private delivery system. Um, um, when it works well, it can really uh, be a thing of beauty. And, and we saw that, you know, during parts of, of COVID. Uh, but I think our task is to make it so that those aren't the exception. And also, that's not just because of the good heartedness of a particular leader, but it's something more systematic. Well, it's funny because I was just about to ask you without naming names, 
uh, although you're, you can if you want. Um, if you were to dif differentiate between those who did step up and those who didn't, uh, what what is it? Is it uh, is it just individual leadership? Is it an active board? Is it a, a place in the community? Is it uh, external advocacy? Or am I? I'm I'm just uh, I'm throwing a lot of darts out. You tell me if any of them hit, or is it just sort of random? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it is individual leadership. Um, and I, I was always someone who was a bit skeptical of this. You know, I, I really believe in structural forces shaping behavior. Um, but there were so many examples that I was personally involved with during the pandemic where going in one direction or another really depended on, uh, on the will, you know, of individual leaders who were at the helm of very powerful institutions. Um, but not to put it all on that because that's not particularly actionable with respect to, you know, what we can do about it other than selecting the best leaders that we possibly can. Uh, and I think there's a role to, um, you know, to forge those relationships even before you're in a time of crisis. This was another reason that we felt really strongly, you know, through something like the chief medical officer role, um, but, uh, but in other ways um, to just work with delivery system partners, you know, in peacetime. Um, and to make it clear, you know, some of this is, uh, is frankly the fault of public health, not, um, you know, not sort of shouting from the rooftops how important uh, that work is uh, and how much, you know, payers benefit from, uh, you know, the, the interventions that are delivered through the public health sector. Or if you think about the public delivery system, you know, New York City Health and Hospitals, where I worked for many years, that is an effective subsidy for so many of the private systems because of uh, the fact that the preponderance of uninsured patients and a very significant number of Medicaid patients, you know, are cared for through that safety net system. And that's true, not just in New York City, but around the country. And all of that needs to be sort of laid bare in a very, um, very forthright, you know, and realistic way to say, look, there are hard economics here that are benefiting certain aspects of the health sector, um, and uh, and so there are responsibilities, you know, that accrue uh, as a result of that as well. So I'm afraid you've you've answered your own question about uh, wishing that it was more systematic than individual, because what you describe is a system where you can be a very successful organization in all the ways that we measure success, not just financially. Uh, by serving, treating a subset of the population with fewer needs. Um, and you can do it very well and you can, uh, as I say, you can be quite successful uh, because those with greater needs have them at least in part met elsewhere. We don't demand that every participant in the system take their share. Mm -hmm. And uh, then, as you say, when you come asking for help, some say we're we're doing fine, thank you very much, and some say, well, you're right, we're all in this together, and it does end up being very individual, which is uh, a limitation. Let's just say, as you say, there's not really a systemic response to to having the right leaders. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's very well described, uh, and and I think that our task, you know, the policy community's task, is to um, to figure out how to change some of those incentives, uh, you know, whether through uh, a more muscular regulatory approach or, um, or otherwise. Uh, you know, there are certainly examples in the healthcare quality movement where, um, you know, some of these changes burgeoned from within, uh, you know, within the, the, the healthcare sector, within the hospital sector. Um, a lot of it does start, you know, with motivated leaders um, but can grow into a movement when there's enough of a, um, you know, of, of a compelling narrative to, um, to get others to see that something does need to change. And I'll just add one other piece to this, which is, um, you know, I think a lot about return on investment and the ways in which, particularly for public health, but this is true for other aspects um, of, you know, our health system, where it is unequivocally true that there are 
very effective interventions that remain underinvested in. You know, when I was a health commissioner, I, I always had a number of examples ready at hand. You know, for every one dollar invested in lead prevention, um, there was a return of two hundred and twenty dollars to society. Or, you know, we ran a pretty small poison control center in New York City, which averted $55 million in downstream healthcare costs for, for our city alone. Um, and so it's not to say that all interventions, you know, have that really eye popping ROI, but there are so many that do that remain underinvested in. And so this is another area where uh, it's about getting more creative with financing. Uh, with taking on some of the like pretty well understood economic challenges, what's called the wrong pocket problem. You know, sometimes uh, the person who is um, laying out the money for a particular intervention doesn't benefit from the downstream savings associated with it, or the fact that we're talking about very long time horizons, particularly when it comes to early childhood interventions, for example. But these are areas where creativity and policymaking can um, you know can have a, a real impact uh, when it comes to shoring up investment in underinvested uh, programs and policies that can both save lives as well as um, provide much more value for the healthcare dollar. Well, and I was going to try to bring in at least briefly the other part of that question uh, that someone from the audience put in about how, how to pay for it, and I think you've begun to answer that. Um, creativity and solving the wrong pocket problems are, are good places to start. Well, as we come uh, to the end of our hour, I always end these conversations with something more about uh, the person who I'm speaking to in their career. You uh, have achieved a very substantial levels of responsibility uh, at a early point in your career, certainly relative to many. Um, I'm curious if you could walk us through a couple of key decision points along the way that got you to where you are based on both your training and your passions. I'd love to just sort of get the story of how one thing led to another. And before you know it, you're the commissioner of New York City's health department. Sure. Well, you know, I have to start by saying I feel so fortunate and, um, and privileged to have had the opportunities uh, that I've had and uh, have, have had the chance to work with truly extraordinary colleagues, you know, all along the way who have taught me far more, I'm sure, than I, than I have taught them. Um, just say, you know, the, the, the branch points that come to mind, uh, one really early one was um, when I finished residency, you know, I was just coming out of this long pipeline of clinical training and, uh, you know, really, had this identity as a clinician, you know, as a doctor. Um, and I faced a choice about whether to, uh, whether to enter into public health or healthcare, because as much as I would like for those not to be siloed, you know, career-wise and, um, and in terms of their organization, they are in so many ways. And, you know, I, I told you, I was, I'm a primary care doctor with a public health heart. And so my heart was directing me to, these places where I'd had really formative experiences like the Louisiana Department of Health or the New York Department of Health. But I ended up um, you know, spending a really important early part of my career in the healthcare delivery system because, um, because I feel very strongly about the need to take those $4 trillion in resources um, to equip myself to understand you know, how that system actually worked and what it took to uh, try to shift that aircraft carrier, you know, if only by a few degrees. Um, and I'm really grateful that I did that uh, before I had the chance to serve as health commissioner because it gave me, uh, you know, an operational understanding, uh, but also that, um, you know, that steeping in how a delivery system actually works that really served me well, you know, particularly during, um, during the pandemic. Um, and then I guess the other one was, you know, when I got the call to serve as health commissioner and, uh, you know, I knew I was stepping into something that would, um, that would challenge me beyond anything that I had experienced to that point. 
uh, because of the combination of the politics and uh, just how formidable the virus and the pandemic were, um, that it would you know press press me to my very limits and beyond in terms of leadership skills. And uh, the the things that got me through that were, um, uh, you know, really sort of keeping um, keeping the people that I served in the center of my mind, uh, particularly the fact that I continued seeing patients, you know, even as, as I was health commissioner, that was something that was so grounding for me when it came to uh, the discussions in city hall, you know, some of the very high level and, you know, the ways in which those things can become abstract. Uh, and so that has always been a real North star in terms of, um, you know, and, and for the mentors that I've had in my life, I've seen how important it is to be able to call upon how policy hits the ground in a very visceral and intuitive way. Um, and, and so for others, you know, who are coming up, students or otherwise, uh, that's something that I encourage you to develop instincts for um, so that you can call upon them, you know, when you're thrust into a position of responsibility as I was. Well, thank you for those very thoughtful responses, and they speak to who you are and uh, the choices you've made. I think it's really wonderful. Um, thank you, Dave, Dr. Chakshi, for uh, being with me today, uh, sharing your insights. Thank you for all the service you've given to the people of New York City and elsewhere, uh, but uh, particularly there. It's, it's really been wonderful to watch your career thus far. And... I will continue to do so. Uh, to our audience, if you enjoyed this conversation, uh, visit healthfairs.org slash events to sign up for other upcoming events, join our email list, and you'll hear about them as they're announced. Earlier this year, we launched Health Affairs Insider, which is a membership program offering exclusive access to content that goes beyond the journal. Become an insider to gain access to these events, curated email newsletters on priority health policy topics and more. We do have an upcoming professional development event uh, designed for insiders on Thursday, October 27th at four o'clock Eastern. Uh, join our Director of Health Equity, Dr. Vabren Watts and our Director of Digital Strategy, Patty Sweet, as they share lessons for health policy content producers gleaned from our year long efforts to publish the October 2022 thematic issue on disability and health. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this and you see some other events on your screen as well our next policy spotlight with uh, Bob Valdez, the head of ARC, coming up uh, not too far into the future. Uh, thank you to all of you for uh, joining us today. Our final thanks again to Dr. Chakshi. Thank you, Alan. And with that, and with that uh, we are adjourned.